this is ceremonial. And in this ceremony, people laugh, they smile, they shake hands, they hug each other, they honor the president. I'm not about any of that. I'm prepared to interact with the president only uh, when he puts up his budget and his agenda that I'm going to have to fight. So let's not talk about this ceremony in relationship to, you know, public policy, real public policy. Speaking I don't choose to go. I don't mm -hmm. choose to go. I don't choose to honor him. I've said that, and I won't be a part of the ceremony. And that's that. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, her one-woman resistance to the normalization of Donald Trump continued this week with a refusal to attend his first address to Congress. And the representative from California's great 43rd district is joining me right now for my moment of Maxine. Thank you. Well, okay. Congresswoman, <laughs> you have really become sort of the physical embodiment of the resistance in Congress. <laughs> Just explain to me why you are so obstinate about even doing something like going to the joint address, which, you know, your other colleagues. Went. Absolutely. Uh, as I watched Donald Trump doing the campaign, I could not believe that this grown man uh, was, could be so offensive. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he mimicked the disabled journalist and when he talked about grabbing women by their private parts, all of that just shocked me. I've never seen anything like that, and particularly someone who's running for the president of the United States of America. I was convinced that he could not represent this country, he was not credible, uh, that he had no good values, and that I would never, ever participate him in what people would consider a normal fashion. Yeah. He's not normal. Uh, and he does not deserve to be honored. And so I don't go to these ceremonial events where you're praising and honoring and uh, exchanging niceties. And for those people who say, oh, he became presidential, he did not. Yeah. He cannot become presidential. He is who he is. And I mean, whatever his socialization was, whatever his upbringing was, he is not someone uh, that deserves to be president of the United States of America, respecting and honoring others, because he does not. Hey, but, and yet you see, for instance, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but the presidents of HBCUs making the, you know, the, the pilgrimage to the Oval Office, taking the photo op, and then later coming out and said, saying some of them, oh, we, we felt like we were used. But people do keep making the pilgrimage. They do keep, it seems like people want very badly to normalize him. Well, uh, people expect that the President of the United States will conduct himself in a certain way. And he has a responsibility uh, for leadership, initiation of the budget, and all of that. So these are presidents of the historically black colleges and universities. They want to upgrade their venues. They want to make sure that the technology is there for the students and so they took a chance yeah. and they came to meet with them only to be used in a photo op yeah well, and, well, and speaking of the way the president of the United States conducts himself I, I have to get your take on the early morning tweet storm and it is sort of ironic that Trump was just <laughs> given um, all of these sort of honorifics that he'd sort of become the president and become to embody the president and then he does this this morning tweeted out a tweet storm accusing former president Barack Obama of tapping his wires, his wires tapped at Trump Tower, and apparently getting this, and we can see all the tweets up there, um, saying, you know, is it legal for a sitting president to be wiretapping a race for president prior to the election? Um, a new low, and saying, I bet you could, you know, get an investigation of it on and on and on, calling, uh, saying it's the new Nixon Watergate, calling the uh, President Obama bad or sick. What do you make of, what is this? He's not normal. There's something wrong with this president. First of all, Obama could not order a wiretap on him. Why does it seem like all the members of Congress know that, but the president doesn't know that? Well, uh, the president doesn't know a lot about government or Congress or how it all works. As a matter of fact, all those promises he was making when he was campaigning, I think that he thought he could come in uh, kind of like dictator style and just tell people what to do. We're going to build this wall and uh, we're going to get rid of Obamacare. Well, you know, 
They still haven't gotten rid of Obamacare, and they're hiding whatever weak proposal they've put together to try and do it. And the wall that he was going to build, the big, beautiful wall, um, now he's coming to the taxpayers and saying, well, I need you to pay for it, even though he had said during the campaign, I'm going to make them pay for it, and now I'm going to make them reimburse me. Yeah. So the man is not trustworthy. Uh, he makes promises. As a matter of fact, I wonder sometimes if he's not taking his cues from Putin. Uh, because he thinks that he can do what Putin does in terms of just tell people what to do, direct the whole Congress what to do. And so I'm not surprised about these comments. I'm surprised that anybody believed him uh, when he read from his script yeah. when he came to the Congress. Instead of, uh, you know, other journalists saying, oh, he really did um, transform himself. He was so presidential. I think he's on his way. I never believed that. Yep. And I'm not surprised by these tweets uh, that he's doing. I'm just surprised that he would try this one more time to make the American people believe him yep. when he talks about Obama having, you know, basically put him under surveillance. Well, I mean, you know, Malcolm Nance was on earlier and said this is an indication of fear, that he understands that the Putin um, story is not going away and that the revelations are only going to get worse. Where does this wind up going in Congress? Well, let me just say this, and I really do uh, wish the American people would pay a lot of attention to what is going on. and. From my point of view, this is not simply because he wants to have a good relationship with Russia and with Putin. This is about oil. When you take a look at what I call the Kremlin clan uh, that surrounds him, they're all connected in some way with either Ukraine or with Russia, with Putin and the Kremlin. And, you know, whether we even talk about Tillerson, who is the Secretary of right. State, I think his number one priority is to get that deal done that Exxon executed with Putin, right. multi-billion dollar deal in order to drill in the Arctic. And I think all of these others, Carter Page, Wilbur Ross, Roger Stone, they're all connected with Russia or the Russia side of the Ukraine. And if we lift the sanctions, which is what they want us to do, right. this is the number one priority. Lift these sanctions so we can all continue to make to money. Yeah, That's and, and, right. and we know there are two bills that are floating through Congress right now to try to prevent uh, the president from being able to lift sanctions without Congress. Do you think they'll pass? Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, he said during the campaign that he wanted to lift those sanctions. Yeah. But when you take a look at John McCain and Lindsey, they said we want to strengthen, strengthen those sanctions. sanctions. We, we, so we, I don't think they're going to get those sanctions lifted. lifted. And I think we really should not allow that to happen. Very quickly, the, yes. you have been so embraced by the resistance, yes. especially the young folks, the resistance yes. love yes. you. Yes. Um, but, but one of the disconnects has been getting that energy that's out there among resistors into politics in a way yes. that actually can change elections and get yes. people elected. Advise your, the Democratic Party, advise your party, how can, you've been embraced, yes. how can the party be embraced by the resistance, who see a lot of Democrats, yes. quite frankly, as the enemy, as the establishment? I know, and I know that there's a lot of talk from Democrats about how do we get the millennials involved? How do we get the young people in? Tell the truth. Speak with some sense of, you know, let's get out the information that we know, that we understand. Let's be as honest as we possibly can. Let's get out of the box, you know, talking to each other in language that does not resonate and connect to young people. I'm so proud of this connection that I've made with these young people. They do call me Auntie Maxine. I embrace that. I love that. And I'm going to be their auntie. I'm going to keep telling the truth. And I want them to get out there, register people to vote, get Get active and bombard, you know, the Congress of the United States and yep. the leadership with what they want them to do. Yep. So I'm just real pleased uh, about. Uh, you know, my followers have gone up from about 47,000 as of this morning. I think it's maybe up to uh, 150,000. I love it. I just love in a it. short period of time. Yeah. Thank you, millennials. Oh, well, uh, give me your Twitter handle. <laughs> give me your Twitter handle. Where they can follow you. Uh, I think it's Rep Maxine Waters on Twitter. Uh, yes. And obviously, people are doing that. And so, Congresswoman, it's such a treat always to see you in thank person. You. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for you my for moment of Maxine. Here. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. May I tell you, like the 
millennials stay woke. Yes, ma'am. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.